Welcome to The Daily Show. Well, thank you. And before we get into the book, I just wanted to say, I honestly have met few people who have lived as much of a life as you have. You mean I'm old? <laughs> no, as some people are old, but they haven't lived ah, life. okay, all right. They really haven't, because, because reading through your story truly fascinated me. I mean, you know, you were at the forefront of uh, opposing the war in Vietnam. You know, you were one of the key individuals who fought for the American government to impose sanctions on the apartheid government in South Africa. You've been fighting for equality in America for a long time. You've been on the front lines, and you are a friend of Dr. King's family. If you look at MLK Day today, and you look at how people have warped his message and his image, et cetera, what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about Dr. King? The biggest misconception is that Martin Luther King was a dreamer who had a dream. Every time I go someplace, people get up and say, yes, he was a dreamer. He was always dreaming. Well, that's because of the speech and the part that's taken out. Uh, Martin Luther King believed in the right to vote. The first speech he gave in Washington at the Prayer Pilgrimage in 1957, his coming out, as it were, in Washington, was about if we ever got the vote, everything mm -hmm. would change. We'd have justice if we just got the vote. That was even after, a year before, they had done the boycott, the Montgomery right. boycott. But over the years, as he evolved, he saw, hey, the vote is important and we should get it, and he continued to fight for it, but voting by itself isn't gonna give us justice. And he concluded that protest is an essential ingredient of politics. You see, politicians want two things. They want you to vote for them and they want to get, re get elected and they want you to vote for them so they can get reelected. Right. Those are the two things they want. <laughs> but the thing you have to want is to make them do what will give you justice and equality in this country and they won't do that unless you make them do it. That's and really that's where protest is involved. Martin Luther King believed in nonviolence. He learned about it, he believed in it, he and Coretta believed in it. It was at the center of their lives. When I say protest is an essential ingredient of politics, I mean nonviolent protest. And the book is about the kind of nonviolent protests you can engage in which will make change. It will make government officials who you elected actually do what they promised they would do. Isn't that unique? How interesting <laughs> that they would actually promise to do something and even try to do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, say you. But that's what, and the other thing the book is about is how every generation has to make its own dent in the wall of injustice. Young people, you know, you have to pass it on. Mm -hmm. All the movements that I talk about in that book, in which I was involved and at the center of some of them, it didn't happen overnight. You didn't go out and have one march. Or you didn't go out and have two marches. And we went on for years until we were able to make change. So young people have to pick up the torch and move forward with it and make their own dent. It takes a long time for it to happen. And Martin Luther King stood for all of that. He didn't live long enough, unfortunately. His life was taken. But in the time that he had with us, he modeled all those things for us. There was another thing he modeled, which was you don't have to be perfect in order to be good and to have a good message. You don't have to be personally perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to. Uh, what you look at is what people do in the cause and what sacrifices they're willing to make. And that doesn't mean that everybody should go out and die. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is we worked hard to end the draft and we succeeded. I can show you, and if you read what's in the book, you will see that we succeeded. When we wanted the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in the Congress, we used strategies and tactics to make it happen. Right. And what you have to do when you protest is keep changing what you do. Don't do the same thing over and over and over again. People get tired. If you did the same thing on your show every night, people would say, ah. <laughs> They wouldn't watch you. <laughs> Change it up. Or uh, if you were like the, the team that played uh, Kansas City right. yesterday, and they just kept on doing the same thing. <laughs> and I kept saying, why don't you do something different? <laughs> so, uh, so, that's, so that's, that's, that's really interesting. So if you, want, if you want student loans forgiven so you don't have to pay off all that right. debt, 
whatever it is you want, organize people, mobilize people to do it in a nonviolent way. Put pressure on. You have to make politicians do stuff. Do you think yes, that climate change? Right. Make them do it. Do you think then our generation has become complacent in thinking that a moment of giant protest counts as as the duration of protest? Because in the book you you talk about how, for instance, with the uh, apartheid movement, the anti-apartheid movement, it took two years for you to get the American government to do something. So right. do you think our generation goes, we have a big march, it trended on Twitter? and now we're done, and we think that's enough, whereas it's supposed to be an ongoing affair. Twitter, putting something out on Twitter is not a movement. (laughs) You can inform people through Twitter. It's very useful for that. Facebook, they're all useful for that. Also, you can be kept under surveillance by the people who are watching you (laughs) while you're doing it. But you have to... What I learned over time, and Martin was an exemplar of that, you have to be present in the moment. You have to do something yourself. You have to be there. You have to put your body on the line. You have to be willing to go to jail. You have to be willing to say, here I stand and you will go no further because I have moral authority in what I'm doing. So use any kind of media for communication and get in touch and stay in touch, although we used to use mimeograph machines and get ink all of our fingers (laughs) and all of that and the rest of it. But you can make change. So the lesson of all this is in this book is if you read it, if there's a change you want to have made, sure, vote. It's an election year. But don't just vote and then go home and say, all right, I did it. Now, four years from now, I'll come back and do it again. That won't get us anywhere. That won't end inequality, and that won't change us and get us justice in this country. If you could organize... Yeah. (laughs) If you... If you could organize a protest today that would last until it, it got the results that it needed, what would you say is the most pressing issue? I know there are many, but what would you say right now would be the most pressing, pressing issue that you think people need to protest for? Climate change. <laughs> because climate change affects all of us without regard to race, or class, or whatever it is. We may not understand that it does, but it does. So I would do it in a way to try to explain to people not just the morality of it, but how their lives are in danger and the lives of their children and so on, and find messaging Mm -hmm. that would help to do that. And the messaging takes time. For the anti-apartheid movement, the steering committee on that movement, which was successful, met every day at my house in the morning for a year and a half. and had protesters out every single day going to jail. We all went to jail multiple times. We boycotted uh, Shell Oil Company. We, we did, we, we made people stop buying Kruger Rands when they didn't even know what Kruger Rands were before. <laughs> uh, we got Nell help to get Nelson out of jail. And oh, was that a great day when right. that happened. And so it takes hard work, it takes thought, it takes using creativity and imagination about how to get the public's attention. We had marches. But when we had marches, we had celebrities, people who folks don't know about. Paul Newman, you guys never heard of him. (laughs) He was an actor. Uh, (laughs) uh, People like that who were out there, you know, doing it. So, in fact, you could, if I were doing it, uh, I would sit down and you could, if anybody wants to start, read the book and come to my house and we'll sit there for another year and a half, going out every day, mobilizing people and figuring out what to do. Sounds like a plan. (laughs) Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Wonderful having you, especially today. History teaches us to resist is available now. Dr. Mary Francis Berry, everybody.